happy to welcome here Danielle Canefo, who's a therapist um, practicing in New York City, where she specialized in working with people with psychosis for using a psychodynamic perspective for 30 years or so. Um, she's also a professor at Long Island University, where she's chaired the concentration on serious mental illness for the past 16 years. She's the author of seven books and over 50 articles. And two years ago, she was the recipient of the Barbara Sandin Award. So let's turn it over to Danielle. Thanks. Welcome. Thank you, Ron. Thank you for inviting me. And um, and uh, I'm very pleased. I'm very pleased to be here and to share with uh, this audience, who I wish I could see, <laughs> um, key concepts in uh, in the work with psychosis, uh, in the understanding and the treatment of psychosis, uh, key concepts that come from psychoanalytic the theory and approaches. So um, I know that this is a very diverse group who I'm speaking to, and I hope that um, what I say, maybe some of it will be you'll find relevant or helpful. Uh, and uh, but this is these are some of the the concepts and the thinking that I have found helpful in my work with psychosis and understanding and, and uh, treating psychosis. So I want to begin um, I, just to, to let you know that I'm going to talk about some concepts. I'll pause in between uh, at various points for questions uh, or comments. I won't just go straight through and I would like some dialogue discussion. I want to begin with a few quotations from uh, famous psychoanalytic thinkers. The first is Freud, who said that when we dream, we are all psychotic. And then there's Harry Stack Sullivan, who said that when we are born, we are all psychotic. And then there's Carl Gustav Jung, who said that a great psychologist is someone who must spend his life in a mental hospital. The question is whether as a doctor or as a patient. So I begin with these great thinkers, all of whom in some way are touching on a very important truth. And that is that in psychoanalytic theory, we believe that psychosis is a fundamental part of everybody's nature. It's not something unique to psychotic individuals. Uh, and, and I think that that's a very important uh, place to begin. So, especially in today's climate, in which there is a medicalization of psychosis and other mental illnesses, there's so much focus on biology, on chemistry of the brain, what's called the medical model or the deficit model because it focuses on deficits. Um, there's not enough study of the mind, the effects of trauma, the wisdom of what has proved healing for people. Psychosis is one phenomenon of human life that takes us to the edge of what it is possible to experience. It's in psychosis that one encounters the most extreme fluidity and rigidity. And that sounds paradoxical, which it is. However, that duality is very important. Just as in trauma, when people experience trauma, there's a, the result numbness on the one hand and a hypervigilance or hyperreactivity on the other hand. In psychosis too, we see enormous fluidity in thinking, what we call looseness of associations, in the sense of self, in the permeability of boundaries, right? In relationships, as well as extreme rigidity, sometimes in fixed delusions or ways of thinking or seeing the world. In relationships, the psychotic person can appear quite cut off 
or alternately very clinging and demanding. So as in creativity, one orders and disorders, one regresses and progresses, one deals with chaos and organization. These dialectics are very important to keep in mind. I want to begin with Freud because psychoanalysis began with Freud. And Freud had a lot of very important and uh, relevant ideas about psychosis. First of all, Freud believed that psychosis is primal in, ex in our experience. Everybody has a, a psychotic core, what Michael Eigen calls a psychotic core. Um, and he was very interested in several, uh, in, in other words, we're all psychotic in our core and we're all psychotic some of the time. And that's important to realize in psychoanalytic thinking, very different from medical model. So he, he was interested in a lot of concepts that were connected to our understanding of psychosis. His interest in narcissism, his interest, and, and people say that psychotics are very narcissistically preoccupied, preoccupied with their own internal world rather than with the external reality. He was interested in primary process thinking, in the, in the thinking of the infantile mind and the id, right? What is, what is primary? What is uncon more unconscious, closer to the unconscious, closer to the present? not collapsing time, past, present, and future. That's primary process thinking. The child hallucinatory wish fulfillment. He saw the infant's mind as when it's not able to get what it wants to gratify its needs, it will hallucinate what it needs. So right from, from the onset, he was in touch with the hallucinatory function in one's mind. The oceanic experience he wrote about, where boundaries become blurred between the self and the other, between the self and the outside world. These are not always bad experiences. It's the experience of the mother and the, the infant. It's the experience of two lovers. And it can be the experience in psychosis. As you all know, Freud was extremely interested in dreams and he considered dreams the royal road to the knowledge of the unconscious mind, of the workings of the unconscious mind. And he wrote that dreams are psychotic. Well, what did he mean by that? He identified several mechanisms that we use in dream work to, that, to help us understand the meanings of the dreams. He felt dreams were meaningful just as he felt that psychotic productions are meaningful. They're not nonsense. They're not gibberish. They're not meaningless. And so he identified certain mechanisms that help us understand the dreams, even if they seem absurd or meaningless to us at first glance. So for example, condensation. What is condensation? Condensation is when two people, one person can represent more than one person. I had a dream. It was about my father, but it didn't look like my father. It looked like my husband. Ah, that's condensation. The, the man in the dream represents two figures, father, husband. I had a dream. I was in my home, but it wasn't the home I live in now. It was my childhood home. That's condensation. Two time periods are being condensed into one. So that's what happens in dreams. And that also happens in psychotic productions. We have to be alert and aware to the multiplicity of meaning of any one particular figure, time, or symbol. Because these things are fluid in psychotic uh, thinking and in dream thinking. Another mechanism is displacement. What is displacement? It's when we move things from one place to another, in particular, emotion. We might say something 
without emotion and then something that really shouldn't have that emotion is suddenly given that emotion. So we move the emotion from where it belongs to belong to something else. And so we have to do detective work to bring the emotion back to where it originally belonged. But you have to understand the mechanism of displacement in order to do that, right? And this happens all the time in dreams. And it also happens all the time in uh, all kinds of psychic uh, function. Symbolization. We know that dreams are filled with symbols, universal symbols and personal symbols. And we have to understand a person's life to know what these symbols mean to them. Same thing with psychotic productions and representability, how these things get represented. So in the dream, they're represented visually in the dream or auditorially, less so. In psychosis, often they're represented in hallucinations, also visually or uh, auditorially. Freud was interested in hypnosis in altered states of consciousness, which are relevant. He was interested in love. He believed that falling in love was akin to being psychotic. <laughs> Some people are crazy in love. They'll say, I'm crazy for her. I'm insane about her, right? Uh, well, why? Because there's an idealization and an overvaluation of the love object right? Often there's a loss of boundaries between the self and the love object. So these, all of these phenomena that are very common, everyday phenomena, have a psychotic element to them. Religion, Freud understood as a universal psychosis. All these people believe in a God that they've never seen and that has no uh, uh, concrete manifestation. He believed that was a sign of psychosis, but a group psychosis. And when he studied groups, he also saw psychotic manifestations in group phenomena. He felt that people give over their ego to the group leader and therefore kind of lose themselves, their own boundaries uh, when they are in groups. And certainly the larger the group, the more likely this is going to happen. So all of these phenomena inform thinking and experience. And so when you think of psychosis, do not think of it as other, the way so many people do. Think of it as something that you personally know something about, no matter who you are. I know some of you out there are people with lived experience but some of you think you are not, and what I'm saying is that you are too. Because we all have these proclivities, we all have parts of our personalities that are psychotic. The foundation of our very self, in many ways, is psychotic. So from this point of view, neurotic defenses emerge to deal with basic psychotic tendencies, that the fundamental self is more of a psychotic self. Psychosis emerges to save the self and to adapt to a terrible reality. And that's very important. For Freud, he saw psychosis as an attempt to, at restitution, an attempt at restitution. So the person, he saw this as an, a form of adaptation. It could be adaptation gone awry. It could be a failed adaptation, but the, the, the drive, the need, the attempt is to adapt, is to repair, is restitutional. And it's very important to see that rather than to focus on the destructive parts um, of psychosis, to see that there is always an attempt to adapt. So in psychoanalytic thinking, one believes that there is a basic madness that informs human life in general, and that sanity is a heroic achievement. 
that not everybody attains. The ego is both sane and mad, but that's a given. And many uh, theorists believe this. Should I pause here and ask if anybody has any questions about Freud or Freudian theory? Okay. Um, so if you do have questions, I encourage people to um, jump and type something in right now. Um, one thing, Danielle, as you talk, I'm, a lot of the things you say seem like things that if somebody introduced them now, they would sound like this completely new thing because it's like everyone has forgotten that anyone even ever said that or that that view made sense or had something behind it. It's, it's, it's kind of amazing. I had, you know, um, I mean, I, I, I don't have a lot of background in the psychodynamic stuff, but some of it is stuff I felt like I had to fight and try to invent or come up with. And, and yet it's, it's, it's ideas that have been around for quite a long time if people knew where to look for them. Yes. Quite a long time, a hundred years, a hundred years, but they have been buried and forgotten and replaced with the medical model. And I think that it's very important to bring them back because uh, these are ways, I think, that help us understand and depathologize uh, what is happening. Yeah. So does anybody have a question? If not, I can move I on. I see a few people are typing. Hopefully those will show up in just a minute. Another thing what you noticed is okay. I really like what you said at the beginning about both the rigidity and the fluidity that you find in, in psychosis. And it seems like a lot of theorists yes. either focus on one or the other and they make it sound like psychosis is this or psychosis is that. So I really like how you captured that it's really both, even though that's paradoxical. It's both. Yeah. Right. So I see Paul is asking, right. is neurosis low-key psychosis or something else? I don't see the questions. Do, are you the only one who can see questions? No, they, they are under chat. That, that people are typing them under chat. It's under the, the regular. Under the oh, oh, yeah. I see. Okay, so it's under the, yeah. the uh, it's neurosis, low key psychosis, or something else. Um, no, I wouldn't call it low key psychosis, but that's that's cute. Um, uh, psychoanalysts usually feel that neurosis has more to is is more involved with conflict conflict between uh the id and the superego conflict between the the id uh, reality the inside the person and their reality conflict between different parts of the self right conflict between the self and others um so it's it's a wish a defense a prohibition um how do we you know how do we resolve these conflicts with psychosis usually it's seen more as a uh, an attempt to repair what has gone wrong an attempt to repair the ego itself so in neurosis the ego is is viewed as relatively strong, but it's, tor it's torn between different parts of the self and trying to resolve conflict. With psychosis, it's seen more as the self is in danger and therefore the, the attempts, the defense mechanisms that are employed to try to adapt to that are more extreme and they're attempting to repair the ego itself. So that's often how, how, uh, how the differentiation is, is made. Okay. So see, David has a question that said, Freud and Lacan certainly drew very clear lines between psychosis and neurosis to the point that he didn't think psychoanalysis was possible with psychotic folks. How does this compare to what you were saying about everybody being mad? Um, okay, well, Freud, um, it's true, Freud contradicted himself a few times, but there was a time when he said that he didn't think that psychoanalysis was possible with psychosis uh, because he thought that the psychotics could not develop a transference 
and for psychoanalytic work, it's very important to work within the transference. I think he was wrong there, and many of us later uh, who work with psycho psychosis believe that he was wrong. They don't develop a neurotic transference, but they might develop a psychotic transference. It's still a transference. You can still work with it. They still can engage in a relationship. Um, in fact, there are some very severe neurotics who, who are much less capable of developing of engaging in a relationship than some psychotic individuals. So I think that he was wrong there. He was wrong on that point. But that doesn't uh, take away some of the insights that he had about psychosis. And also, if you look at some of his cases, even the cases that he considered neurotic, like his cases of hysteria, um, many of them today would be diagnosed as psychotic. So he did work with psychosis. <laughs> so I see another question from Yurdi. I'm probably not pronouncing that right. But anyway, says, I am interested in what you said about dialectics and the inherent paradoxes and contradictions in psychosis in terms of causality and presentation of symptoms as Bates, Bateson and Louise Sass talked about it. Could you say more about contradictions? Okay, I'm seeing a lot of questions are coming in. I don't know how many questions to take and, and how much to go on because yeah. otherwise I won't um, I, I, cover. I may cover some of these questions as I go on. So I think maybe at this point I'll go on and then if I don't cover something, we can go back to some of the questions just so that we can cover a little bit more material. Sounds great. Okay, yep. is that fine? Yeah. Okay. So the, the other person I would like to introduce you to, everybody's heard of Freud, of course, but not everybody has heard of Edward Podvall. And Edward Podvall, I want to introduce you to. He was a psychoanalyst who uh, worked with psychosis, but he was also a Buddhist monk. And so he had a very interesting uh, uh, combination of, of uh, theoretical understanding and humane understanding of work with psychosis. So he also uh, believed that alongside and embedded within psychotic suffering, there exists always a potential clarity and openness of mind and heart. Now, you know, those of you who know a little bit about Buddhism know that, you know, Buddhism aims at achieving this presence of mind and clarity. That's part of what the meditation practice is meant to achieve. So instead of simply taking a history of illness, Podval advises that we take a history of sanity. So for example, most people who adhere to the medical model will ask about, do you have these symptoms? How long have you had these symptoms? What's your medication history? What's your compliance with medication? What's the family history, right? Those are the questions that are focused on. Rarely does one ask about the content of the hallucinations or delusions, about the person's strengths or talents, about their own understanding of what is happening to him or her, about experiences that they had with previous therapy, what was helpful, what was not helpful. So one doesn't just make meaning by using diagnosis. One, you know, constructing a narrative of an illness is what they're doing, not a narrative of a person with a history and with meaning, with a meaning-making uh, sy system. So what he came up with were what he called marks of sanity. So like Freud and like Bion and other people, other analysts, he believed that nobody is psychotic 100% of the time. Nobody. Nobody is healthy 100% of the time. Nobody is psychotic 100% of the time. It just doesn't exist. So he advised us to look for these marks of sanity, what he called islands of clarity islands of clarity. And he named five of them, and I'm going to go over the five. The first one, 
he called repulsion, which is interesting. Repulsion is a sign of sanity for Podval. What does he mean? He meant if a person is re repulsed by the way they're living, by, by if they're sick and tired of being the way they are. In um, Alcoholics Anonymous, for example, they have a saying, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. That's what he means. If somebody is, is disgusted or repulsed by the way they are, that means they can imagine a different way of being. They're already observing themselves from the outside, which is already a sign of health, to have that observing ego, to be able to look at oneself and say, you know what, this is not, this is not good, or this is, I don't want to be this way, or I want, there's another way, a better way for me to be. That distancing, that observing from the outside is already a sign of health. Humor, if somebody can laugh at oneself, or joke about oneself. That's already a sign of health. You know, when somebody has no sense of humor about their condition, then they're too close to it. They can't, they can't distance from it. So that, when you see that, that can be a sign of sanity, as he says. The second is what he calls a longing to transcend the self. Now, you know, in Buddhism, people want to transcend oneself. Uh, and the ego. And he felt that psychosis, in essence, is an F attempt to transcend the self. Why? Because the self is suffering. The self is filled with suffering. And so if we can transcend the self, we can cease that suffering. The third is the urge for discipline. Now, I trained for many, many, many years, and no one ever, ever discussed discipline as a sign of health. And yet, with my 35 years of experience, I've seen that discipline is a very important sign of health. The ability to keep to a schedule, the ability to, um, to channel one's mental or physical activities and energies towards a particular activity, art, cooking, gardening, exercise, therapy, the ability to do these things. Any one is already uh, a sign of clarity, right? So if I have a, a patient, I, I, see, I see people who are going through psychosis in, in uh, outpatient therapy. If they're able to keep their appointments, right? That's already a sign of discipline. They can do that. That's already a sign of health. Um, I had a patient who could only, the only sign of discipline was coming, coming to see me. That's not completely true. He would get dressed. That's also a sign of discipline. He didn't come to me naked. Uh, he, could, he was eating minimally. <clears throat> I had him start walking his dog, things like that, just entering little uh, areas, more areas of discipline into his life. And until he started feeling like he belonged to the rest of the world. The next, the next mark of sanity, according to Podval, is compassion. Compassion towards others and compassion towards oneself. Sometimes the person has compassion for the therapist. And uh, it doesn't always express itself in, in the ways we might, we might think. So for example, I had a patient who felt very unsafe in the therapy. So when I asked her, what would make you feel safer? She said, I would feel safer if, if you had an Uzi, an Uzi. Uh, and so one might see this as not a sign of health. But when I spoke to her about it, she said that she felt she was filled with with evil and malignant uh, uh, desires. And therefore, if I had an Uzi, I could protect myself from her evil. So even though at first glance, this might seem quite crazy, when we talked about it, 
she was really showing some signs of compassion for me that I would be protected in this treatment. And if she felt I was protected, she could calm down and feel safe. Finally, the fifth island of clarity for Podval is courage. Fear is perhaps one of Bertram Karen, when he wrote about his book on schizophrenia, said that fear is the one common denominator you can find among psychotic persons. And it's true that fear is very common in psychosis. Fear of what is happening to one, fear of the other, fear of reality, or what one sees as reality. And courage can, make, can take many forms. I'm going to give you an example from a patient of mine. Uh, and I hope nobody objects to my using the word patient. I know some people say client or cons whatever, consumer. I'm just going to use patient. That's how I was trained, so it stayed with me. So I had a patient who confessed to me two years into the treatment that every time he came to therapy, he saw hundreds of rats outside of my office building. And it took him an hour before he could find a little pathway to make his way through the rats into the building to come and see me. So if you're working with the medical model, you immediately think this is psychotic person hallucinating rats. Let's put him on medication fast. If you're a Podvolian, you would say, well, isn't this interesting? This person hallucinates. Now, there are rats in New York, so it's not like <laughs> you can't see rats. However, usually you, don't see, usually you don't see hundreds of them outside of a building. So he was hallucinating these rats. And he also probably hallucinated the opening to come see me. So what I saw in this was the enormous courage that this person was coming to me every day and facing repulsion, the repulsive rats, the scary fear of the rats, fear of what he was going to see, what he was going to discover, fear of the treatment that got symbolized in these rats. And yet he persevered until... He was able to see an opening, came to my office, was never late, and never missed a session. So here is a sign of courage, enormous courage. So it all depends on how one looks at, at something to be able to see these islands of clarity, these marks of sanity. If you're only looking for pathology, for deficit, then that's what you're going to find. But if you are open to looking for these islands of clarity, you will find those too. And that's what you can work with. So I'll pause here for a minute. I see a few questions. Yeah. Podvol. P-O-D-V-O-L-L. -L. Yeah. He wrote a book on psychosis. Yes. One question I wanted to ask, um, I think what um, the, the, an interesting angle on it is that well, that sometimes people manifest these strengths that you're talking about, but in an extreme way. Like I've seen some people go to some extreme in disciplines. I'm thinking of one of my clients who really restricts his eating in this extreme way. Or... Or somebody, sometimes people will have a lot of fears, but then at some point they'll suddenly shift to completely ignoring their fears and doing outrageous things regardless of any, you know, so, so they'll take that strength but go to an extreme. Does that sound right to you that you see that sometimes? And how, how do you? Yes, sure. That's the, what we started with, the fluidity, rigidity. Yeah. You know, these things can be taken to the, what, what can begin as something you know, courageous or fluid, open, can turn into something uh, on the other end. And, 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 and one has to be 
keen to to watch the movements. I think from my, yeah. From my own experience of being one in could be a reaction to the other. Yeah. From my own experience, I, I'd get so stuck on one side, and then I'd realize something was wrong with that, but I wouldn't be able to envision the middle, and so I would just flip to the opposite extreme. I think a lot of people have had that experience in right. one way or another. Right. But we have to help people find that middle yes. ground. Yes, and then once somebody does that, you can show them how they've gone from here to there. And now that they've been on both ends, let's see if we can, you know, bring it, bring it in a little bit now that they've experienced both, both ends. Okay. And David pointed out that you seem to be... Off meds. Oh, yeah. Okay, go ahead and answer that if you want. Um, do I treat patients on meds or off meds? I, um, um, medication is for me the last resort. I, I, I've treated many, many patients without medication. Um, some, some people want medication. Um, I often take people off medication to see what's happening. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in the next section. Um, the relationship between fear and psychosis, observed this relation in the U.S. and the hospitals in big Indian cities, but interestingly in rural northern fear India, people don't always respond with fear to psychosis. That's very interesting. So somebody has written that uh, in India, people don't always respond with fear to psychosis. I think that's very interesting. Um, I do know that uh, in India, uh, people have better recovery rates than in the United States. Um, and that may be because as a culture, and uh, they're less uh, um, isolated, uh, the families accept them and go through the treatment with them, from what I understand. Um, so perhaps there's less fear, less to be afraid of in that culture. In our culture, you're medicalized, you're isolated, you're, you're uh, um, taken over in many ways. And so it's not just what's happening to one that is frightening. It's then what, the way one is treated and what one is told that is frightening. You're told you have a, you know, a chemical imbalance that you have to take medication for the rest of your life. You're not, things aren't looked at as episodes, the way people have depressive episodes, they have psychotic episodes. Um, and so they're not given hope uh, that they can change or uh, evolve from this. And so, of course, that's very frightening, all right, in addition to what, whatever one is experiencing. So that's a very interesting um, comment, if that's true. How does one work with voice? Okay, we're getting all over the place. The dissonance between how you understand your experience and how others do it has a part to play in it. I'm not sure what that question is asking. Shall I continue, Ron? Yeah, I think that, that's great. People really want to hear what you have to say and what you have prepared. Okay. Okay, let me continue. And then we can, you know, go back and forth with questions. You can ask me personal questions about my work as well, even if I don't cover it. But what I wanted to talk a little bit about is symptoms, psychotic symptoms. Um, psychotic symptoms signal that a human being is fighting for his or her life. One has to, as I said before, appreciate the adaptive function of the symptoms, always psychotic and neurotic symptoms. They're always trying to adapt to something. That's what a symptom is made from defense mechanisms and defense mechanisms are defending, they're protecting, they're caretaking. So, so it's very important to keep that in mind when one, when one approaches a symptom. By eliminating symptoms, one removes the meaning that the patient is making of his or her situation. A situation that can cause a breakdown rather than prevent it. If you take away a person's meaning, and if, you know, because symptoms contain meaning, if you take away a person's meaning, 
then sometimes people that will precipitate a breakdown rather than uh, cure it. So instead, I believe in treating symptoms with respect, with curiosity, convey to the person that uh, he or she has the capacity to create meaning and to be an important contributor to the treatment. This person created their meaning and therefore they have something to bring to the treatment. It's not just me as doctor who's going to tell the person what's right and wrong, right? And what's healthy and what's pathological. So working with psychotic symptoms for me is, is a method of forming a therapeutic alliance. For example, I had a patient who uh, became enamored with his boss, female boss, okay? And when he confessed to her his love for her, she did not reciprocate and she told him that she was involved with someone else. And my patient became psychotic. He developed erotomania towards his boss, an obsessive uh, preoccupation with the boss, and a delusional system which denied the reality that this boss was not in love with my patient. He began writing to her every day. He began interpreting every kind of communication from her or from colleagues or from friends as all meaning that the boss actually does indeed love her, him. He was unable to sleep, he was agitated, he was hypervigilant, and he came to treatment. And in the beginning he said to me, my mind broke. My mind broke. But as we explored slowly, gently, what had happened and how he felt vulnerable and he loved this person and this person didn't reciprocate and he was left with the enormous pain uh, of what this meant and how this also echoed past pains and rejections and abandonments. He was able to replace the sentence, my mind broke, with my heart was broken. Once he said my heart was broken, we were in business. Because now he was representing more accurately the reality of what had happened to him. And then we could proceed to understand his delusional system as his manner of trying to adapt to this reality, this painful reality that this person did not love him, that was too, too much to bear at the time. And much of the therapeutic work afterwards centered on mourning a love that never was. So that's an example of using the symptoms and the work with the patient to understand the meaning that goes into the symptoms. Freud and Jung, who worked, Jung worked a lot more with psychotic patients than Freud did, believe that symptoms hold meaning, they contain meaning. And so to just eliminate them, you're, you're getting rid of your main source of understanding of a patient. So I regard the symptom as a way in not a way out. By taking the symptoms seriously, we can facilitate the rapport with the patient. We're inviting them to be credible informants about their own condition. And thus we partner with them. They're collaborators in the treatment. If one doesn't do this, then the only clue the patient offers regarding what ails him or her, these symptoms, then we're left with an unequal relationship, then we have to play doctor, right? Defining what's wrong with the patient, taking full responsibility for the way to fix that wrong. And also artificially eliminating symptoms can, can result in the risk of sealing over what is really wrong with the person 
what is really bothering them rather than integrating them in a healthier manner, like I did with this patient with the erotomania. So it's very important, I think, to work with symptoms, to understand them as meaning making and to not rush to eliminate them because this is where you're gonna get the material to work with. And it's also the way you establish a therapeutic alliance with somebody. So here's a few guidelines on working with symptoms. The first is you take what you can get. You take what you can get. Symptoms are what people offer us. And therefore, they're the material we have to work with. Often patients with psychotic symptoms are wary. They're, they're watchful. They're guarded. So it's helpful to meet them where they are in order to establish a therapeutic alliance. I use the word therapeutic alliance a lot because there is no treatment without a therapeutic alliance. You work within a relationship. And so unlike what Freud said, that when he thought that the psychotic couldn't form a relationship, they can form relationships, but you have to respect where they're coming from and invite them to collaborate with you and show a curiosity about their minds for them to willingly engage and, and uh, become part, collaborate with you in this relationship. When you do that, when you show respect for the symptoms, it usually comes as a surprise to patients because they're accustomed to others who poo-poo the symptoms, who, um, including professionals, maybe especially professionals, who don't respect their view of life. Who, who, um, and that surprise element can work uh, to your advantage. They might be curious about you because you're interested in something that nobody else really takes an interest in. It gives credibility to the patient's strengths, which is my main message here today. Rather than treat symptoms as signs of an illness, it's helpful to see them as efforts, however flawed, at adaptation and caretaking. So for example, there was a patient hospitalized patient who um, who hallucinated many children who were in her hospital room. And when the therapist tried to enter the room, she screamed, don't step on Tony, don't step on Tony. Now the therapist looked around, there was no, he didn't see any Tony, he didn't see anyone except for the patient. But what we found out was that Mrs. G, we'll call her, lost her mother when she was eight years old. And all of these so-called children in, this, in her room that only she could see were all under the age of eight. So here was a clear connection that highlighted the way that she employed her imagination to vicariously mother herself after her own mother had passed away. Now you can't just deliver that to somebody. It took a while to figure that out along with her. But what is the patient adapting to? You have to ask yourself. Many think that there's a person hidden underneath the psychosis, underneath the psychotic symptoms that needs to come out. I'm saying that the person is revealed in their psychotic symptoms, not hidden. Symptoms are the window to the person. You just have to look in. They're also a way of attenuating affect, of regulating affect, emotions. So Mrs. G, the patient I just told you about, she was unable to say, I'm lonely. I need a hug, but she created these children whom she could hug and she could express affect towards at the limits of her tolerance. Symptoms have a heuristic value. By paying attention to symptoms, we assume they will eventually lead us to a greater understanding of the context in which the symptoms arose as well as the person's meaning-making system. This is how they make meaning, 
through their system. We are meaning making creatures, human beings. So everybody makes meaning. Psychotics make meaning in their way. And the trick is, how do we understand that meaning? Rather than trying to force them to adapt and adopt our meaning, some collective meaning, let's try to understand their meaning and how that meaning came about. The other thing that's unusual or an unusual way of thinking about it, not very popular, is that there is continuity in personality. Once we understand that adaptation arises from somewhere and attempts to get somewhere else, then we can help patients appreciate the continuity in their lives. This point attacks the idea of a break. Everybody talks about psychotic breaks. What's the break? The break with reality, mostly, right? The break within oneself, skits, why people don't like the term schizophrenia, one of the reasons. Skits means divide, split, right? So when we talk about psychosis, a lot of people talk about the break, the before and after, as if there's no continuity there. But what I'm saying is that the symptom is the bridge between that before and after. And so it behooves us to pay attention to the bridge in order to be able to work with the patient on the continuity of what their experience is and has been. Working with symptoms also establishes the authority of the patient. Even if their symptoms appear like a riddle, one can nonetheless communicate that they are meaningful, that they're credible, even though they might be puzzling. And usually they're the clue to major issues. So let's go back to Mrs. G. One may not understand everything about her symptoms. Why, did she, why is she hallucinating all these children that she's uh, taking care of in her room? But, the one th but, but immediately you can know two things. Don't step on Tony, oh my God, he, you're gonna kill him. You know, one, her world is filled with danger and two, that she was assigned the role of protector. Those two facts, which you get from her psychotic symptoms, are very informative. And you can start building on that. You build from there. So even if you don't understand all that went into it, you can already understand she's fearful, she lives in a dangerous world, she's the protector. That's already a beginning, a huge beginning to work with somebody. Symptoms are driven by intelligence, by logic. It's wrongly assumed that symptoms are emotions gone berserk. If one takes the time to understand the meaning of symptoms, one is able to appreciate the enormous logic that they contain. But you have to take the time because symptoms communicate. No matter how tentative, no matter how confused or smoke screened they are, symptoms are an effort to reveal something, to communicate something. In Mrs. G's case, the paradox of her life was revealed through her symptoms. She needed the children to live, and yet she also needed them to die. Eventually they died off one at a time so that she could go on living. So this model of working with psychosis differs, as I'm sure you've already noticed, from the current practice, despite the fact that both models focus on symptoms. The medical model employs the DSM to ascertain which symptoms are present in order to diagnose, to categorize a mental illness. This model also looks at symptoms very closely, but we're not advocating assessing the presence or absence of, for diagnostic purposes. Rather, we use symptoms to guide, to understand the patient's dynamics and also 
we look at symptoms as invitations to embark on collaborative work. So instead of focusing on symptoms as signs of pathology and disease or disability, we regard symptoms as creative attempts to adapt and to survive. The focus here is on the strengths rather than the weaknesses and viewing symptoms as a pathway to the therapeutic alliance, collaboration, and meaning making rather than obstacles and resistances to be eliminated. This approach offers hope, not only for the, to the therapist, but to the patient. I'll pause here. And if anybody has questions. Um, yeah, there were a few up there, like one is how long your treatment does, usually runs and how many times a week? Um, how long? Well, that depends. That depends on the person. There's no formula here. I don't work according to formulas. So it depends. You know, sometimes uh, I've seen many people with first episode psychosis within uh, a few months. The, 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 the psychosis is resolved. Now, does the person want to then stay and work deeper on what, you know, what led to that, the deeper, the deeper issues? Sometimes they do, they stay on, sometimes they don't. They're happy that the psychosis is resolved. Um, uh, so usually six months for a first episode. Um, but I've worked with uh, other people for 10 years or more. Um, the intensity when somebody is going through an acute psychotic phase, I like to see them just about every day um, because you have to uh, work with, with the force of the acute uh, uh, emotions and, and thoughts that are, that are going on. And I try to uh, avoid hospitalization at all costs. And so um, I intensify the, the individual therapy, at least during the, uh, the acute episode. And then we can uh, taper off. If the person can't come in every day, I try to have contact with them every day. It's, it's, uh, it takes a lot of dedic dedication, yeah, yeah. this kind of work. Um, uh Raja has a question, can you talk about anger and violence um, in schizophrenia or what's called schizophrenia? What's, oh, is that SX, SXS? Um, anger and violence, okay. Yes, sometimes this is a, a part of it. Now. Uh, another psychoanalyst, psychoanalytic theorist, is Wilfred Bion, and he talked a lot about um, the anger that that uh, is in psychosis. He too, like Freud, like some of the others that that I've mentioned, believed that we are both psychotic and non-psychotic. That um, rather than see two personalities. Uh, he saw two parts of one person. And I think that's very, very important. The, the concept that he added that I find very helpful is what he called attacks on linking. Attacks on linking, on links. Most of our thinking, most of our being is about links. We link to other people, our thoughts link one to the other. We link our mind to our body, ourselves to others, ourselves to reality, to different things. And he felt that in psychosis, there was, uh, uh, there's a lot of aggression and that that aggression gets expressed by attacking the links whether it's uh, the link between the self and the other, between the self and reality, between one thought and another thought. And that's how he explained that the, the psychotic language or thinking is so uh, choppy and doesn't
doesn't make sense a lot of times because the thinking itself is being attacked. The aggression is, is directed towards the thinking. And that makes it very challenging to work with somebody. So for example, I had somebody who was in a, a, a very severe psychotic episode. And every time we would make a little progress, he would get some insight, we would make some connections. And the next day he would come in as if nothing, nothing. We would be starting all over again. Why? He was attacking whatever we had accomplished, whatever was between us, whatever meaning was made was attacked and we had to start all over. It was like Groundhog Day. Oh, I disappeared. <laughs> it was like Groundhog Day, every session. It was very frustrating and I needed a lot of patience to get so through it that. It sounds like you would talk about the fact that you again, saw that happening. Is that what, what you did? Kind of said, well, could you, could you sort of explore that in some way? Violence. Yes. Yes. Look what just happened. Yes. Yes. So in psychoanalytic work, you don't just work on meanings you also you the most important work is the process is attention to process so you see not just oh you attack look what happened when we went from here to there did you notice that yesterday yesterday we were here and now we're back to the beginning so you bring attention to the process not just the 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 content at any any specific moment process is very important look what just happened when we spoke about this you attacked me or when we you know when we did this you attack yeah yeah you have to tolerate enormous amounts of aggression when you're working with uh with yeah, psychotic I'm not sure individuals why, let's not worry about it um, enormous amounts of aggression so, and sometimes that can be very very challenging for the therapist. I keep going in and out here, I see. Um, now, violence, violence is different from aggression. Violence, if, if, if I'm, I don't know if you mean, if, if, if I'm feeling threatened uh, by someone, then, you know, that's more, that's more serious than just the expression of aggression in the, in the treatment or, you know, violence towards me or, or violence towards themselves, right? Psychotic persons are most vulnerable to violence against them or either from others or from themselves than, uh, than acting out uh, actions of violence. And that I take very okay. seriously. So um, Terry was wondering, I work with families with supporting supportive systems so that I, I, don't, I don't just work alone when, especially when somebody is going through a, a, a psychotic episode, I bring in, I need support. It's a very isolating work. It's difficult and it's isolating. And so you need to know that there, you have other people who are, who are helping out here. You know, even if you see a person every day, it's only for 45 minutes that day, you want to know that the person is protected and and cared for for the rest of the time. Any other interesting questions? Do I ever terminate patients because of what? The violence or aggression? No, no. They say my voice is going in and out. Um, no, I don't terminate patients. I feel a responsibility once I take somebody on to see them through, but the, the treatment may change depending on what the needs are, their needs and my needs. You know, Harold Searles, who, who was a very famous psychoanalyst who worked with psychosis at Chestnut Lodge for many years, said that the, the therapist has to sit in the most comfortable chair. What does that mean? We can't do this work if we're not comfortable. So we do need to feel comfortable to do this kind of work. 
we can't just think of the comfort of, of, of the person that we're seeing. But yeah, I'm not sure why that is. So um, somebody mentioned that they want, wanted you to um, say something about that the other resources. Is bad. How's the connection the person, now? They wanted to hear from other, about other resources before we, we're done. I think following up on the, the same kind of lines of thinking that you've been presenting Resources about. For, for what exactly? For treatment, to read about? I think so. Like who to read? Is that what you mean? I don't know if that's what they meant. Connection with others, bad too. Connection is fluid. Okay, so the, apparently the connection is not great right now. Um, I want to answer this question uh, about uh, about the communication with psychotics, the the salad, word salad, and things like that. Um, A lot of psychotics have difficulty expressing themselves, or they think that they're expressing them, they're expressing themselves, but we have difficulty understanding. Here's what I tell my students. You know, uh, you know, I'm an immigrant, and, and English is not my first language, but, and, and uh, I've lived on three different continents. I love to travel. I love speaking different languages. When I travel, I don't look for the people who speak English. I don't look for the foods that I'm familiar with. When I travel, I want to learn about that culture. And even if it means I'm at a loss, I don't understand the language, I don't understand the culture, I don't understand the norms, but little by little, if I give myself time, if I observe, if I'm curious, then I will start picking things up. Even if I don't pick up the language completely, I'll start picking up certain nuances, certain inf inflections in the language, and I'll start understanding what people are saying. It's a wonderful test for people working with psychosis. Because what you want is a lot of people will talk to a psychotic individual who's speaking in word salads, who's, who's I don't know what, and they'll say, oh, he's talking gibberish. He's making no sense. Um, what does that mean? It means I don't understand what he's saying. It doesn't necessarily mean he's making no sense. I approach it as if I'm going to another country and I don't yet know this culture. I don't yet know this language. But if I sit with this person, if I observe this person long enough, if I am curious about this person's language, eventually, I will begin to understand what they are communicating to me. The thing is not to impose your system, your language, your way of expressing yourself onto the other person and saying, well, why don't they just express themselves this way? That's not the way it works. Just take your time. Sit with a person one, one day a second day, a third day, suddenly you'll start realizing, you know what, this person says, you know, uh, uh, is talking about a sofa every day. That's one thing that comes up again and again. Okay, what's the sofa? Where's the sofa? Which sofa? Is it a sofa here? Is it a sofa at home? Did something happen on the sofa? You start honing in on certain symbols, certain themes, certain things that repeat themselves. And little by little, you build up an understanding of what the person is communicating to you. But you can't go in the way you would is, where's the McDonald's? Where's the food I'm familiar with? No, go as if you're, every person is a country, is a world. Every person should be approached as a new world and with that curiosity and the excitement of discovery. 
And then you will see that even the psychotic with word salad, with who seems the most outlandish, who seems the most opaque, will begin to start making sense. Just don't expect it all at once. That's all. Somebody's not hearing anything. I don't know why the sound is not consistent here. Um, okay. Let's see. A lot, a lot of the comments are about the, the poor sound quality. Uh, people want me to recommend readings. Um, so let me recommend a few readings before we stop. Um, well, there's, of course, the uh, look up Edward Podval. You will uh, uh, read that. There's, I, I would have prepared if I had known um, a, few, a few readings. Some of the British psychoanalysts are the best uh, when it comes to working with psychosis, much better than American psychoanalysts. For some reason, psychiatry took over American uh, uh, American uh, psychoanalysis in work with psychosis, and the the psychoanalysts just kind of gave up. Um, not everybody, but but a lot and too many. Um, so I would go to the British authors. Winnicott Winnicott worked with psychosis. He thought that regression sometimes was helpful in psychosis, that people freeze at a certain early point in their lives because of environmental failure, and that it's helpful for a person to regress back to that point in order to deal with what was happening and defrost what was frozen, usually big parts of the self, so that they can progress uh, from there. So Winnicott on psychosis, beyond. Wilfred Bion on psychosis, Hodval, um, um, I've written a few, I've written a few uh, papers uh, on psychosis. Um, John Steiner wrote a book on psychic retreats. He talks about the retreat from reality to a safe place that um, one can see psychosis really in terms of a psychic retreat from a reality that is too trauma traumatic or, or painful. Yes, I see here somebody wrote that Milton Erickson, uh, the hypnotist, the famous hypnotist, would record uh, a, a, a schizophrenic person speaking in word salad. Uh, that's, I, I would recommend that, that if you can, for those of you who are practitioners, record the uh, communication if the person lets you. If they're paranoid, they probably won't. And, and then listen to it over and over again. And what you will find is that eventually you'll start understanding and you'll start hearing themes and you'll start, even if you don't fully understand it, you'll start getting things that you can ask the person about. I notice you talk a lot about such and such, right? Um, you know, what does that mean for you? Or, you know, tell me more about that. Right, so you, you'll just find more points of entry, or you'll also, in terms of looking at process, you'll see when they speak about certain things, do they get excited or anxious afterwards? When they speak about other things, do they get calmed down? So you can look at the process, not just the words of 
the communication. That will tell you a lot and that then informs how you intervene. <laughs> it's been like a session. <laughs> I like that. Uh, what about for the lay person? Recommended readings for families. Oh, I, yeah, there aren't that many really good ones, uh, at least that I know of. Um, let me think. There's a good, um, there's, Ron, you may know more about this. The, the British, there's a British group that put out a pamphlet for families about uh, understanding psychosis. Do you know what I'm talking about? They posted it on ISPS, I think two years ago. If, if you write to me, whoever wants, if somebody wants references, write to me, danielleknafo at gmail.com. Uh, and I will be happy to uh, put together some relevant uh, references. I, I didn't think about it for today, so I'm sorry, I'm not as uh, prepared for that. Mm. Yeah, Onto a lot of complaints about the connection. Email out to you guys. Yeah. The last, I, I, I have a few minutes, right? Okay. Right, right. Are we going to finish or do I have a few minutes? Yeah. I have a few minutes. Well, people are are kind of checking out now. So maybe we'll maybe we'll end here and uh, invite people to contact me if they want um if they want information or references i'll be happy to provide them i'll put together a little uh bibliography for people if any for anybody who wants to look into any of these theories uh further and have some some good uh reading material on them <laughs>